Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, last week we talked about a very common malady among people, much less Christians. It's called discouragement. We all get discouraged from time to time. We all get, now don't, don't adjust it on my account. I, I'm all right. It's, it's cool enough in here. I'm just hot. I'm hot under the collar. <laughs> we all get discouraged from time to time. There are things that take place, though, that I think that we as Christians, that we can earmark these things and we can look for these things. Last week, we talked that one of the main reasons for discouragement was failed expectations. And by that, I meant that we expect things to be a certain way. And when you serve God, if you serve him very long, you'll find out that things are usually not the way you expect them to be. And so we, we go through life expecting God to do this and expecting God to do that, and God may or may not do what we expect him to do, but he seldom does it in the way that we think he's going to do it. Serving God can be pretty exciting sometimes. It can be pretty exciting when you don't know what tomorrow holds, but we do know that we're in God's hand and he holds our tomorrow. And so that's, that's how we live our life. We live our life on a day-by-day -day trusting of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today I want to talk about something called what I call spiritual fatigue. Now you're not going to find that expression in the Bible. I'm not teaching you something that's a heresy here this morning. But I think when I begin to describe what I call spiritual fatigue, I think you'll recognize uh, uh, what I'm talking about here. And we'll see scripture that will back up this. And what I'm talking about in spiritual fatigue <clears throat> is that if we don't learn how to wait in faith, if we don't if we go through and begin to allow discouragement into our heart, we get fatigued, spiritually speaking. And this stalls our faith. This, this brings our faith to a place where, where we kind of get our mind off of, of, of what the problem is and get our mind on, 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 the, on the fact that what's happening is not what we thought it was going to be. So it kind of plays back into it. And it brings our faith to a standstill. And you see people all the time that love the Lord and they're serving the Lord with all their heart and they're giving the Lord everything they got, but they get discouraged because this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen or, or it doesn't happen again in a way that we expect it to happen. And, and, and instead of going on and persevering, going on and persevering through with our faith, we allow these setbacks to discourage us. We, we allow, it just brings us to a place where our faith is just tired. We're just... We still have faith, but we're believing for what we see, not what we believe for in the first place. Well, God's done this, you know, he's done this much, and I was expecting this much, but I guess that's all that he was going to do in the first place. And that's not how God wants us to deal with these. You know, this, this you got to understand that the devil will bring you plenty of scary scenarios. He'll bring you all the possibilities of how bad things can go in your circumstance and situation when you're, when you're convinced that, that uh, uh, God has given up on this thing, that God wouldn't, maybe wouldn't really enter it in the first place. Maybe you, maybe you miss God. You ever said that one? Well, I think I just miss God on this. You know? and, and sometimes we do. Sometimes we do those things. But we can't allow that to deter our faith. We can't allow that to be a setback to us. You know, uh, uh, a lot of times we want to begin to re revise what God has envisioned to us in the first place. He gives us a vision about something. He, he tells us that this is what we're to do, and we set out to do that. Well, as things don't start not to work out as we had expected them to, then we begin to revise what we think God said to us in the first place. We don't do it in an attempt to, to be deceptive. We do it in an attempt to try to make our faith work, to try to go, well, okay, I had faith for this much, but I didn't have, evidently I didn't have enough faith for that much. But God wants us, he doesn't want us revising what he's told us. If God has told you something, if God has spoken to you, and you know God has spoken to you, and that's, that's a whole, another subject there. But as a believer, you should know when God's speaking to you. You should know that, number one, is it consistent with the Word of God? Amen. Is what he's saying to me, is it, you know, he's not going to tell you to go in the post office and, and, and go crazy. Amen. You know, I, I remember when the term postal become, uh, uh, 
uh, an expression was because a guy went into a post office and started killing people and told everybody God told him to do it. Well, God's not going to tell you to do something that's contrary to the Word of God. He's not going to do that. And so you know that if it's not scriptural, then God's not going to tell you to do that. The second thing to know God is whether or not it is in line with what else God is doing in your life. God does not change his mind about his plan for you. The Bible tells us that the call is without repentance. That means he's not going to call you to do something today and change his mind about it tomorrow. Well, I've decided that, you know, I called you to preach, Brother Maldon, but, you know, you're not doing too hot, so I think I'm going to, I think i got another plan for you. I think we're going to demote you down, or we're going to do this, or we're going to promote you, or demote you, or transfer, lateral transfer is what they call it a lot of times. I'm going to do all these things to change my plan for you. That's not consistent with what God's doing in your life. God knows the beginning, he knows where you're at, and he knows where you're going. And he's not going to change his plan for you. The third thing is to realize that God does have a plan for you. Listen to me. If you're a born-again believer this morning, if you believe in Jesus, if your faith is firmly in that Lamb of God that we talked about a while ago, then God has a plan for you. And and I'll repeat myself from Wednesday night a little bit. Not just call you to come and sit on a pew. That's part of it. But God has got things that he wants to do through you. Amen. There are, he has a plan, and he wants to bring it into your life. He wants you to be in the middle of that. So what he, what he tells you to do is going to be consistent with what else he's doing in your life. He's not going to tell you uh, to start a, a church here at 7th and Waterall, call it Crossway Church, and then in the middle of that go, no, nope, I want you to go and moved to Tupelo, Mississippi, and, and I want you to start an orphanage. You know, that's not how God works. From part A to part B, there'll be a second part to that. But again, it'll be the things that's going on, all that's going on around you will, will fall in, those pieces will fall into place. I remember when we were looking for this building. We, we were in the building out there, and, and we were leasing out on a highway out there, and Candace and I looked at every building that we could find, every storefront. And I'm talking about we looked at some rat traps and, and thinking, well, maybe we could do this and do a little painting and, and do this. Now, you know, we would, we'd visualize it all in our mind, and for whatever reason, it wouldn't quite work out. But I knew that I had heard from God when he told me to start Crossway Church. I knew you might say, well, that wasn't consistent with, no, it was exactly consistent with what he had been doing in my heart and life. And if you don't think God has a sense of humor, you know, he brings us full circle in about uh, three years, right back 150 yards from where we started. And we're right here 150 yards from where we started with a, with a better facility and, and knowing that it was God's plan all along for us to be here, the timing of all of that had to be just as it was. God's timing. We talked about timing last week. Timing's different than waiting on God. Timing is essential to the pieces falling into place. And if God's spoken to you, then you can know that the pieces will fall into place. I looked at, I looked, I knew that this merger that took place here between the previous church that was here and the Nash Church of Christ, I knew that they were going to do that for some three years. They'd been talking about it at least that long. But it had just never materialized. Well, lo and behold, I run into a man that I really didn't know that well. I know him uh, to, to speak to him. But I run into him at the hospital, and he tells me he's upset that they've had their last service in this hospital, I mean in this church, that night prior to that. I was visiting my uncle. He was visiting his mother-in-law, who just happened to be right next door to each other. I asked him, what are they going to do with the church? They're going to sell it. Well, what I didn't know was that the school, Liberty Island School, wanted to buy this building over here uh, to make a, a, a cooking school out of it, a culinary, I believe is what they call it, culinary school out of it. And so they were looking at buying the whole property because basically what we paid for everything is about 
You probably couldn't bill that right now for what we paid for the whole property. Well, I didn't know that they were looking at the property already. They already had people in the church who was already talking to them. So I run into this man on a, on a Thursday or Tuesday, I believe it was. And uh, nine days later, we're signing the papers on this church. Now, that's God operating and moving. And you know that God's in it because it's consistent with everything that he had set out to do. I knew that when they told me which church it was, I knew that it was 150 yards from where we started. I had always felt, you know, when we moved out, I, I felt, although that building was in remarkable need of repair, I knew that this was the neighborhood we were supposed to minister in. This was the neighborhood that God had called us to. All of that was consistent. So I can't allow the devil to come in and start trying to revise my plan in the middle of that. I can't, I can't get tired of, of, of waiting on God to move. I mean, this, this went on for a year and a half. This went on for a year and a half. We started Crossway Church on December the 5th of 05. And it was uh, not until September the, uh, excuse me, May the 29th of 07 that we signed the final papers on it. And so God moves. He'll do the same thing in your life. He began to open doors, close doors. What we have to do is be sensitive enough to the Spirit of God to know when he's dealing with us about something so that we'll know that we will stay in the middle of God's will. Now, you look at the nation of Israel. You'll remember in the book of Numbers that we, that we looked at last week where we were talking about the story of the nation of Israel leaving Egypt, and they got to the promised land. And just as they got to the promised land, they saw all the giants in the land. They sent 12 spies. Moses sent 12 spies. And out of the 12, only two come back with enough faith to say, hey, we can take it. But here are these people who have been in captivity. God has done a miraculous thing bringing them out of this nation. Without an arrow being shot, without a spear being used or we would say in modern days without a, a shot being fired. They are brought out of the nation of Egypt. Not only are they brought out of the nation of Egypt, they sacked the wealth of Egypt when they left. And they not only sacked the wealth of Egypt when they left, they were delivered and sacked the wealth of Egypt and had Egypt's blessing to get on out. Now that's God allowing his plan to move smoothly. I mean, by the time they left, those people were so glad to see them go. Just go. Yeah, here, take this too. Here, you forgot this. Amen. The Bible tells us that's exactly what took place. Well, they go, and then, of course, this Pharaoh was uh, not too good at keeping his promises. And he decides after he lets go, what am I doing? The Bible says that the Lord hardened his heart. God allowed his heart to be hardened by the sin that was already there. And so at the last ditch moment, he grabs his army and says, we're going after them. And we're going to bring every last one of them back. And we're going to make it harder on them than it's ever been before. So they take off after them. And Moses finds himself in, and, and there's a lot of estimates. The Bible tells us there's about 600,000 men who could carry a sword back in those days. I would think that probably we're looking at 6 million Jews. History tells us there were about 6 million killed in the Holocaust. I think there were 6 million that left Egypt. That's just my personal opinion. Might have been 5, might have been 2, might have been 20. I don't know. But about 6 million people. For the sake of illustration here, I'm going to use that figure. And now they have their backs to the sea, and the Egyptian army is moving closely on them. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that Moses heard from God, and he literally opened up the sea, and they crossed over to the other side. Well, the Egyptians, thinking, well, if they can do it, we can do it, followed them behind. And as we all know, they all drowned in the sea. One, one 
uh, historian said, well, he said, the only reason they were able to cross the Red Sea at that time because it was only six inches deep. And I thought, it isn't amazing how they drowned all them Egyptians in six inches of water. <laughs> but the Bible says that they went across on dry land. Dry land. And you don't, you don't, you know, you, you don't drown people in six inches of water unless you're going to hold their face down, face down. So, you know, historians can believe whatever they want to believe. We believe by faith. We know what the Bible says. I, I take it literally. I don't think this is metaphorically speaking or anything like that. I believe that the Lord somehow miraculously opened up that sea. They walked across. I mean, if, if you've ever been in a, a pond that's just been drained, you know one thing's not going to happen. You're not just going to walk through that pond barefooted. Because you're going to bog down to the point that you can't move. You got to understand they're carrying everything they own. They have carts, they have livestock. You can imagine what a mess that would have been just from the mud alone. But the Bible says they crossed over on dry land. Now the historians can try to they can try to to figure that out any way they want to figure it out. I believe what the Word of God says. <clears throat> And they crossed over on dry land. They see miracle after miracle after miracle. And now here they are. They've finally been brought to what God has promised them. Brought them to a place where God had promised that they could have. And instead of continuing in faith, after seeing all of that, after seeing all of that, he's fed them. He's... He's uh, provided water for them. He's, he's brought them through the wilderness. But for some reason or other, they saw the giants and they panicked. That's what we do a lot of times with the promises of God. We get so tired in the journey waiting on that promise to take place. And we find ourselves prayed out played out, and put out. Prayed out, played out, and put out. I didn't intend on saying that. That's, that's good. But that's exactly when we find ourselves oftentimes waiting on something that God said he's going to do. And we're going, well, Lord, when's this going to happen? You see, there's three different things that we always forget. We always think that God does not understand our circumstance. You ever explain your problem to God? Yeah. I'm talking about getting detail, you know. Yeah. Well, God, if you'll get here by Tuesday, you know, and, and do this by 3.30 p.m., well, you know, this won't happen and this won't take place. And you've done that. Come on now. You've got to understand that God knows your circumstance better than you do. Yeah. Second thing is you've got to understand that there's no test or no trial. There's no problem that's too big for God. And a third thing that, that, that gets us is, you know, we talked last week about timing. And I told you timing was different than waiting on God. The third thing that brings discouragement to us and makes us spiritually fatigued is not knowing how to wait on God. Not having the simple understanding of patience. We've got to understand that God brought them once again to this new land. He wanted them to learn something through the fact that, you know, I mean, he, he could have brought them, he could have kept them a place pristine and clean for them to come into with no fighting, no, no troubles of any kind. He could have just opened the door to whatever land that he wanted to. And brought them into it. But he brought them to a land that had been occupied by the enemy. God's going to bring you to a place. And, and his promise to you, he's not going to give it to you on a golden platter. It, it's just like raising a child. By the way, if you have children, you need to, you, you need to come Wednesday night. I'm, I'm going to be preaching a little bit on on uh, some things that I feel the Lord would have us to hear as church. 
But if you come to that place, God's going to not just give it to you on a golden platter as if we would if we spoiled our child. What happens when we give a child everything that they ever dreamed of or ever wanted without making them work for it? My, my youngest, <laughs> youngest son turned 40 today. You don't think that'll make you feel old. <laughs> 40 years old. He has a good work ethic. My two daughters, my other son, all have a good work ethic. When I grew up, I started working at the age of 13. I got a good work ethic. These are things that were taught, but not necessarily easy. I mean, I went to school with guys who were buying new cars. Parents would buy them a new car and just give them keys and tell them to go. I was lucky if I had something to drive at all. And if I did, then, then I had to pay my own way. I didn't have my own car during my high school years. Oh, woe is me. It just really destroyed my life. I mean, you have kids today that are so spoiled, they think, it, well, I, I'm, get, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm already right here on Wednesday. But God understands that, and he knows that what he promises us, there's a process that you go through to get that promise. Yes, yes he could just give it to you and lay it on a golden platter. But if that was the case, you would never grow. You would never prosper. You would never grow spiritually. And so what the devil does is that he tries to wear us out while we're waiting on the promise. It's the devil's desire that you quit. before your promise comes to pass. He knows your are go to, go to Psalms 33. I'm going to hit several scriptures today. Psalms 33, if you have your Bible. If you don't, shame on you. you got to know, the Bible tells us that the Lord knows the numbers of hairs on our head. Now, boy, you're talking about having a, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, they said he had a file on everybody. But even J. Edgar Hoover didn't have that kind of information. Verse 18, Psalms 33. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. As long as you're trusting in God, as long as you're looking to him, no matter what your circumstance is, you, you, you look at the physical of your circumstance. Well, God is greater than your circumstance. He's not taken surprise by what you're going through. You know, he showed me that several years ago, and you've heard me say that many, many times, that God's not surprised by your problem. But he showed me that. I mean, I had something that just popped up out of left field. I, it hit me blindside. And I was doing the woe is me thing in prayer. And the Lord said, I wasn't surprised. I said, I don't guess you would. He said, I was not surprised. I was not caught off guard. He said, I got your situation in hand. What a comfort. Now, all I have to do is believe that. All I have to do is trust that. All I have to do is operate as if with the understanding and the knowledge that he knows my circumstance. Think about that a moment. Think about what I just said. We run around here worrying about uh, whatever the problem is, that bill that we can't pay or that, that uh, circumstance that we just can't seem to work out. And we live our lives worrying over these things, having anxiety over these things, being blindsided by these things, 
trying to figure out what in the world that we're going to do. And God has not lost one ounce of sleep over it. But we know, we know he doesn't sleep. So what does that mean to us? That means if you'll, if you'll live your Christian experience, if you'll live your relationship with Christ, with the knowledge, well, God knows my problems. We say we surrender all when we come to salvation. We say that, that we're just putting ourselves in his hands, and then we start trying to help him manage things. Well, Lord, I, you know, if this doesn't happen by Tuesday, now this is going to happen, and if that happens, you know what's going to happen next. You've probably heard me say this, too. God's been in the God business a long time. He knows how to be God. And the last person in the world he needs with help with your problem is you. What he needs you to do is have faith. What he needs you to do is to trust him. That means we, I don't mean we sit back and just say, well, you know, I'm going to jump off his building. God's going to catch me. But we listen to God, we obey God, and we don't spend a lot of time worrying about the circumstances. Second Timothy chapter 1 tells us that he will keep our soul. Yes. That keeping of the soul takes place from the day you give your heart to Christ yes. to the day you go home to be with him. Yes. And then you're in his care forever. Yes. He'll keep your soul. He knows all. He's fully prepared. He, he is not only able to bring victory, he will bring victory. You didn't hear that. A couple of you amen it, but you don't understand what I'm saying. He's not only able to bring victory, but he will bring victory. Now, I didn't say that he's going to bring it the way you thought it ought to be. Because, you see, we're looking at circumstances and go, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> no, I, I didn't need that, Lord. I needed that by Tuesday. Remember? I told you, Tuesday, 3.30. You, you, you messed up, Lord. No, he didn't. He's messed up anything. He knows exactly what he's doing. And the victory is his. He is going to bring about the victory. Your circumstance and situation may not end like you think it ought to end, but it will end according to what he thinks it ought to end. And that's the true victory anyway. Because what you think you've just got to have or what just has to be done a certain way, God's got his own idea on that. And he will accomplish his purpose in you. Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. Yes. Yes. It's going to work out. There's going to be victory in that. The victory has already been accomplished 2,000 years ago on the cross. And all you have to do is trust him for the definition and the finite uh, points of the problem. Amen? Amen? Second part of that is, there's nothing too big for God. Oh, we'll say that in a heartbeat. Oh, nothing too big for my God. But I don't know what he's going to do about this. We, we, we speak one thing and we think another. Well, is there anything out there that's too big? I don't think anybody in here would argue that there's a problem that's not too big for God. There's no such thing. But yet we allow that to beat at our faith when it's a big problem, when it's a giant. I mean, when David killed Goliath, the whole army had come into a, a place of, of spiritual fatigue. They were, just, they were just at their wits end. What are we going to do? Saul's walking around going, hey, look, I'll give you my daughter if you just go out there and fight this. He can't find anybody in the entire army to fight Goliath. Why? Because they looked at the situation at just as they did, these spies did and said, them giants are over there, man. We can't take a bunch of giants. They looked at the size of the problem. I, I, I've had people that I try to minister to 
And no matter what I would say, they'd, be, they'd have a comeback. Yes. Well, yeah, but this. Well, all you, have to do, you, you need to have faith. You need to believe God. For, well, yeah, I know, but this. And it was a constant, you know, just a, a, a constant thing. And I finally told him one day, I said, look, you know, I, I don't have all the answers, but I know God does. And I said, I know it deals with faith. And I said, you keep taking this thing. You just, it's like, you know, okay, well, you, he solved this problem, but now I got this problem. Well, join the race. You know, it, it comes down to sooner or later, you either trust God to deliver you from your circumstances or you struggle through them on your own. Now, I've been on both sides of that fence. I dealt with my own problems for a long time. I won some, lost most. But when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I decided that it was his. Amen. That this life was his, the breath in these lungs is his. Better for worse. Like when you get married, you say for better or for worse. When we serve God, we're doing the same thing. We're marrying him. We're giving our heart and soul to him. Yes. We're, we're committing to him. Yes. So if you're going to commit your soul to him, if you're going to commit your spirit man to him, if you're going to commit your physical body to him, yes. then you need to go ahead and throw the problems in while you're at it. You're missing one of the greatest fringe benefits yes. that there is serving Christ. Yes. You know, a lot of times kids are getting an argument about whose dad can beat up whose dad. You know, my daddy can beat your daddy up. Uh-uh. My daddy's strong. I saw him the other day. Boy, he lifted this thing. He's strong. My daddy could beat up your daddy. I mean, when I was growing up, boy, I thought my daddy was catch me out. I mean, I thought he was something. I, somebody was talking about drinking coffee the other day. I said, I started drinking coffee because my daddy drank coffee. I didn't like it. It tastes like better water to me pretty fond of it today I told my 40 year old son I said you gotta, gotta acquire a taste for it and he said why in the world would I want to acquire a taste for something I don't like I said that's a pretty good point <laughs> I didn't have a comeback for that one but we say my daddy can beat up your daddy but yet as, as believers we see these giants we don't understand that our heavenly father is bigger than that giant. He's bigger than any problem. How's that song go? Bigger than any problem, bigger than anything. And so it doesn't matter how big the problem is. It doesn't matter the difficulty of the problem. So why spend your spiritual energy worrying about it? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the longer you look at it, the longer you study on it, old country phrase, the bigger that problem is going to look. I learned a long time ago when you're going to fight, a, uh, fight something that, you know, you don't sit there and think about it too long. You mess around and talk yourself out of it. Best thing to do is just dive on in there and get it on. And that's what we need to do with the devil. We need to know that God is in our corner. I mean, we start thinking about what all the devil says and what all he can do. How many of you in here talk to the devil? Anybody? Better, I, I, I'm going to say. We don't, we don't call it talking to the devil, but we sure as well listen to him a lot. We give ear to the devil all the time. And I can't find one thing in this Bible that tells me I've got to listen to anything he says. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells me he's a liar anyway. Why talk to a liar? Why talk to somebody who's not going to do anything but lie to you, deceive you, and try to lead you down the wrong path? But when we come into these circumstances, when we come into these situations, we sit and we give ear to the devil. Oh, boy, if I do this, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and, and, and I don't know what will happen on this. God just wants you to trust him. He doesn't want you listening to the devil. He doesn't want you 
conversing with the devil. You know, we all know about faith and we understand what faith is. And we'll tell our brother and sister, well, you just need to have faith. And then we'll turn right around and let a problem bully us and back off of it because we don't think that, you know, we're up to the challenge. We need to practice what we preach. You know, I mean, we'll quote scriptures to them. We we'll walk around living in fear and depression all the time, telling everybody about all our troubles, how bad things are, instead of confessing. And I'm not talking about the confession principle, but you know, we need to confess God's goodness. Amen. Amen. We have we have testimony night on Wednesday night, and sometimes people get up here and all they'll talk about is how bad things are. Well, that's not testifying to God's goodness. That's testifying to what the devil's accomplishing. You're going to, if you're going to testify, get up and tell how good Jesus is. Get up and tell how wonderful he is. Well, you don't know what I went through last week. Well, I might not, but he does. Get up and tell everybody how good he is. Quit worrying about telling them what all didn't, didn't go right. Tell them about God's goodness. But sooner or later, he's going to see you through that circumstance. Amen. Third thing. It brings on spiritual fatigue worse than anything. That's waiting on God. We don't like to wait. That's just be honest about it. Anybody in here like to wait? My wife will tell you right now, I'm the most impatient human being in the world when it comes to a doctor's office. I kid you not. When I, when I schedule a doctor's visit, I want the first one of the day. I tell them, I say, you can't get me in first and go to the next day. Find me somewhere where I can be the first one in. But I'm not going to like sitting, you know, I just about soon sit in a barber chair. I love my barber. My barber is my nephew's wife, and I love her to death. Sweetest thing in the world. She cuts my hair, does a pretty good job. But I hate sitting in that chair. It just seems like I could be doing something else, anything else other than sitting in that chair. Sitting in a doctor's office has the same ring to it. We just don't, as human beings, we just don't like to wait. We live in an instant world anyway, you know. If you want anything, all you got to do is you can get it instantly. I can go home and I can have supper ready, you know, with a five-minute delay at the restaurant. I can go by and pick up dinner after church, and we get home, we got dinner ready. I like that. Why? Because I don't like to wait. And so as believers, sometimes we have the same problem because I'm going to tell you right now, God never gets in a hurry. Now, I didn't say he never did anything in a hurry, but he never gets in a hurry. I just made a mess on the pew here. He never gets in a hurry. We, we, we cry out to him and we ask him to intervene. We ask him for, for intercession into our circumstance and our situation. Believe in him that, that he's going to do what needs to be done. And we hang on, and what happens? Things seem to get worse. We think, uh-oh, God, did, did, did you hear my prayer? I mean, I was asking, remember Tuesday, 3.30? It's Tuesday morning. Where you at, God? And then we begin to second-guess God. Does... Uh, did I really, did he really make me this promise? You know, sometimes we'll get so frustrated, we'll go, am I even saved? God, are you hearing me? You want to say, God, have you changed your mind about this promise? Have I somehow another sinned to the point that I've brought about the ruination of this plan of yours? We think we know how God works. One thing I've learned about how God works is that I don't always understand how he works. But I know he works. You see, a lot of times we're taught one way, but our faith approve otherwise. 
I mean, he, sometimes he'll bring us to the point of a reasonable doubt. In law enforcement, if, if you make a case on somebody, you must prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And sometimes we find ourselves in those situations with God and we go, what in the world's going on? Why is this so, di why is this like pulling teeth? I'll tell you why. It's called spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare will always consume time. Because without that, you're never going, again, you're never going to really grow spiritually. If you're never, it, it's like any other warrior. The ones who have been in combat before, they always tell the young guys, you see that old timer over there? When the shooting starts, you stay real close to him, and you might make it through there. That's been told over and over and over and over again throughout history about warfare. We need to learn as believers that spiritual warfare is just that. It is a war for your soul. And our biggest enemy is our inability to wait, to wait upon God to do what he wants to do. We're constantly operating under the illusion that God is late, that he's not where he needs to be when he needs to be there. Remember, his timing is perfect. His timing is immaculate. His timing is so precise that he knows exactly. And what he needs you to do is continue to, to fight the fight of faith, continue to believe that he's going to do what he said he would do, knowing that he's not only able, he's capable, he's willing, and he is going to accomplish his will in your circumstance. Don't allow spiritual fatigue to wear you down to where you quit believing. That's what spiritual fatigue does. It brings you to a point where your faith is damaged. And that's the devil's intent in the first place. He's not intimidated by your problem. The problem with discouragement is that frustration is an eventual following of that. If, you, if you're operating in discouragement, it's oftentimes a result of frustration. Frustration leads to dissatisfaction. And dissatisfaction can lead to all kinds of things. When you get dissatisfied with what God's doing, you know, that's what children of Israel did here. What they do, they began to murmur. You know what murmur means? It's a, it's a half express a half-hearted expression or grumble. That's the definition of it in the Bible and the dictionary. I thought, what in the world does that mean? That means you want to gripe, but you don't want nobody to know you're griping. That's a murmur. I thought, boy, that's a perfect definition. Well, I'm going to gripe, but I, you know, kids are, kids are great at that. They're, I mean, they have that down to a fine art. They want to get their complaint across, but they don't want anybody to point the finger at them that, hey, they're complaining. Sound like church people, don't it? Sorry. No, I'm not. It's true. I'm not sorry about the truth. We need to learn to wait on God, knowing that he is going to accomplish what he says he's going to accomplish. I mean, it comes down to believe in and trust in him to do what he said he'd do. Yeah. Now, if God's made a promise to you, yeah. it's going to come to pass. Yeah. 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 Goes back to last week. Don't have failed expect. Don't start expecting uh, this is how he's going to do it. That's where we get in trouble in the first place. And so when he starts to move, even when he starts to, to accomplish things, we don't even recognize it because of what we talked about last week. We, we've got this expectation of what he's doing. Yes. 
I'm going to be honest with you. When we moved in this church, I expected to have these pews filled in about a year or two. Does that mean that his promise is not going to take place? No, that was a failed expectation. I had an expectation that he didn't tell. He didn't say, hey, two years, your pews be full. Now, I've got to wait on God to do what God's going to do, not only in me, but in you and everybody else that's involved. And all I have to do is have faith that he's going to do what he promised he would do. I can't put him in a, I can't put the clock on him. Unless he tells me, you know, if he tells me he was going to do it in two years, then yeah, I'd expect him to do it in two years. So, so what he's promised doesn't always look like what we thought it was going to look like. So if I allow that to, to frustrate me, then I'm going, to, I'm going to get dissatisfied. And if I don't watch, I'll start murmuring or complaining or start having thoughts that are not in line with what he's doing. Now I've been distracted off the promise I'm over here all worried about my little situation, my circumstance that didn't happen like I thought it was going to. And God's plan still over here waiting on me to wake up. Yes. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. And so as I'm over here outside of God's plan now, not by his, his design, but by my own failure to have faith in what he's promised, I'm over here dissatisfied, grumbling, mumbling, mad because it ain't working out like I thought it was going to. But I could come back over here and get back in faith and say, okay, God, I ain't got a clue what you're doing. But I know you're doing something. I know that you promised this, and if you promised it, it's going to, it's going to happen. You see, over here, I'm thinking that well, you know, this don't look like I thought it was going to look like. And, you know, I, I, I see all these empty pews out here. And, 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 and you know, I, it should be this way. See, I, I'm not even thinking along the lines of the promise. I'm not looking at the promise. I'm looking at the problem. And ironically speaking, the problem's not God. It's me or you. You've taken yourself out of his plan and brought yourself into a place of just total dissatisfaction. The truth of the matter is you're dissatisfied with God. Ooh, that sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? But that's where we get when our faith begins to fail. I mean, we don't say, God, I'm dissatisfied with you. You know, we're smarter than that. Lord, I just don't understand what's going on. Can't you hear me, Lord? Yeah, you need to get back over there in the plan. Quit worried about what's not like you thought it was going to be. Because all that's going to bring about in you is dissatisfaction, going to frustrate you. And when you get frustrated, now your, your, your mind is not even on the essentials of the plan. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yes. Am I doing a bad job of explaining this? My phone's just ringing and doing all sorts of stuff. When you get a text message, it makes more noise than when it's ringing. People think, well, I'll text him. I know he's preaching, but, you know. I told you about my son preaching that time. Somebody called him on the phone. He thought, who in the world would be dumb enough to call me on Wednesday night at 7.30? He looked at the phone right quick, just told his congregation, said, excuse me, he looked at his phone, he was his brother. <laughs> he answered the phone right there in front of his congregation. Hello? What are you doing, man? <laughs> well, it's Wednesday night, 7.30, what do you think I'm doing? Oh, yeah, it is Wednesday, ain't it? You know. <laughs> Only my two sons could pull that one off. <clears throat> I love them. I'm going to close with this. Candice, if y'all come. What you need to understand 
that if you'll stay in God's plan, stay in the promise, that's what I'm talking about, about the plan. Stay in faith. Stay, stay focused on him. Continue to serve him. Psalm 62 and 5 says, They shall not be ashamed who wait on me. If I call you up and say, I'll meet you at uh, Burger Doodle on State Line <clears throat> at 12 o'clock. And I start heading that way, and I'm late getting there. If you don't wait on me, then I can't pick you up. Even if I am later than you expected me to be, if you'll wait, I'll be there. And what God's saying here in Psalm 62, 5 is he said, you won't be ashamed if you wait on me. It may not, it may not look good right now. But if you'll wait on me, what I told you was going to take place is going to take place. What I told you was going to happen is going to happen. Habakkuk 2 and 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Though it tarry, wait for it. Third time. Though it tarry, wait for it. Though it tarry, wait for it. If God has spoken to you in your relationship with him, when things don't begin to work out exactly like you thought that you wait on him, trust him. Because the rest of that verse says, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. I say it will surely come. Whatever God's promised you, it will surely come. That vision, that, that thing that he's spoken to your heart, it will take place. If you'll stop and look at your relationship with him throughout your service with him, the whole time you've been saved, every time you've waited on him, you've not been ashamed. It's those times where you mess things up by doing your own thing. That's where the problem centered is. We've got to learn to listen to the Lord and obey Him. When, when the Lord lays something on our heart, don't take it lightly. If God speaks to you, you need to do this. You need to do what He says to do. Because if you don't, you're over here out of His plan. You're out of the promise. And then you're mad at Him because everything's not working out good. You have problems. You have this situation. You have that. Stay in God's plan. Stay in the promise that he's given you. Don't drift off. Don't allow dissatisfaction or frustration to derail your faith and bring you into a place where you're just spiritually fatigued. You're, you're to a place where you're just tired of waiting. Waiting is essential to God's promise. Unless he's given you a time frame. It's never over. If he's giving you a time frame, it'll happen in that time frame. Amen? Amen? I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. Been down that road many, many times. We don't want to get outside of God's plan. We don't want to drift from the promise drift out of the promise into our own frustration and our own dissatisfaction and our own discouragement. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. Every believer in here, be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. Whatever God's promised you, he's not a man that he should lie. And he will bring it to pass. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, I come this morning and I ask that you minister today to those who are discouraged. Whatever 
has brought about that discouragement, Lord God. I know you have the solution. And I want to open up this altar this morning. Yet to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Well, he's calling you out today. He wants to bring you into the promise. He wants to bring you into his plan for your life. If that's you this morning, you need to come on down here and let him change your life. Anybody here? Any person here that you're not convinced that you're saved this morning? You're not even sure if you know what saved means. If you don't know what saved means, then you need to come down here. You need to come down here right now. Anybody here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. God wants to change your life, young lady. 